the fire and life safety director. There are so many different emergencies that you have to be prepared for. We'll discuss many of those in this training video, such as biological, chemical, CO and natural gas release, explosions, suspicious packages, civil disturbances, failure of power utilities, property damage, and active shooter. The fire and life safety director position is one that you are constantly training and evaluating your fire and life safety plan. One of the most important things to understand is what type of emergency are you dealing with? And is it inside of the building or is it outside of the building? Then deal with the affected area first, then the rest of the building, but always make sure to call 911 and get the first responders there to assist. world. We want to make sure that we're on the cutting edge of preparedness to respond to those threats. Coming through. Three M sponge sticks, okay. more three by three sterile gauze. Yeah, that's back. Yeah. Inside your box, ready to go. Three of us will set up. Yeah. Right here, right here. This is an opportunity for us as the health department to test our environmental sampling plan, as well as some of the protocols we developed around sampling for a biological threat agent release. Okay, we got to label it? We work very closely with our partner agencies around creating a citywide biological emergency plan. Participating agencies include NYPD, FDNY, Department of Environmental Protection, MTA Police, FBI, Port Authority Police, and New York City Transit Hazmat. After a biological incident, New York City will send teams out to the field to collect environmental samples. The information we learn from these samples is critical. It will help us understand the scale and scope of the incident. We've been planning for this exercise for the past three years. We're looking to get feedback from all of the uh, emergency response agencies and we'll implement whatever recommendations they give us. We need to be prepared for the, the very real threat of bioterrorism. Should an emergency happen, it's so critical that government is able to step in to protect the public. We've been receiving federal preparedness funds for over a decade, and they've been essential in what we've been able to do. Hire staff, purchase equipment, uh, plan exercises like the one you saw today. Without continued funding, the most densely populated city in the country would be at great risk and have great exposure to biological threats. The public expects that government will be ready to perform a critical role in a response. In order for us to be able to deliver on that role, we have to have the funding to build the capabilities to be ready. 
we understand that lives are on the line. These are our friends, our family, our neighbors, our community. And it's essential that we be prepared so that we can protect them. Over the past decade, we've built tremendous capability to respond successfully to disease outbreaks, hurricanes, terrorism. New York City continues to be at great risk for a terrorist attack, making federal support to emergency preparedness indispensable. Now is not the time to take our foot off the gas. We must continue to invest in federal emergency preparedness funds. video obtained by CBS2 shows security camera footage from across the street the moment two East Harlem buildings exploded. The first hint of disaster seen and felt here on the right side of the screen when windows shadow seemingly out of nowhere. Then and only then on the left side of the screen, a cloud of thick black smoke begins to pour into the street as the actual building explode. Then watch closely as a man walking across the street is nearly knocked off his feet by the blast. He ducks, trying to cover his head, then he's pushed back and seems disoriented, caught up in a tornado of paper and pieces of flying debris. A tree and street sign struggle to stay upright in the midst of a fierce blast. Now to a camera pointing the opposite angle, south on Park Avenue. Watch again as the initial concussion blows across the street, shattering windows and sending glass raining down on cars below. Then on the right side of the screen, the powerful eruption as the buildings begin to fall. And the smoke, that thick black cloud, fills the street. White dust fills the screen. So the earthquake, there's an explosion, like, connecting to your building. So you just, it's insane stuff. Those who witness the explosion say the images and the fear are impossible to forget. It sounded like a bomb. I looked up, the building was gone. And the smoke coming out, it was piling up. It felt like I was on the battlefield. The first thing I did is bend down, and I did like this, whoa! In the aftermath, a mountain of rubble as seen from Chopper 2 today. Hundreds of emergency responders digging for hours on end. A single wall remains now as workers search for victims and survivors. Vehicles pulled from the site are searing images of the deadly blast. In an SUV, a car seat in a back is mangled and pinned beneath rocks and chunks of cement. An ambulance is totaled inside disheveled and covered with thick gray dust. I couldn't breathe. It was just so bad. As investigators search for what caused the explosion, these exclusive images will serve as a key clue in helping them piece together the timeline, chain of events, and sheer power of a blast that's left an entire city shaken.
bustling and developing story right now here in New York City. A massive explosion, a steam pipe erupting underground, the plume shooting up several stories. Nearly 50 buildings were evacuated today. There are real concerns at this hour about asbestos detected in that pipe, possibly contaminating dozens of buildings. All of this paralyzing a major part of the city for several hours. The explosion shattering the street there, firefighters and hosing workers down at the scene. And ABC's Lindsay Davis is near the scene of the blast for us tonight. Mayhem in Manhattan this morning after this violent steam pipe eruption, paralyzing part of New York City just before rush hour, spewing steam, asphalt, and debris several stories high, covering famed Fifth Avenue and the cars on it with thick mud. You can get an idea of how much steam is floating through Midtown. First responders trying to evacuate the streets as the plume billows just feet away from them. As soon as I heard a loud explosion, I just booked it and ran. Officials say at 6.39 this morning, a 20-inch, 86-year-old steam pipe ruptured, leaving five people with minor injuries, creating a large crater in the street. You can see how close this car came to direct impact. Thank God this happened so early in the morning that there were many fewer people present than would normally be. But tonight, the new concern? The pipe that burst was determined to contain potentially hazardous asbestos. My sweatshirt's covered in mud and it didn't get my skin. It's in my hair still. <laughs> but I'm alive and I'm safe and I'm grateful. There's real concern about whether any debris entered into buildings or into air conditioning systems. Several blocks along Fifth Avenue and nearly 50 buildings shut down. I want to get to my office, but I like to avoid the air. Firefighters were first sprayed down, then showered off in a decontamination tent. And anyone in the area at the time is being advised to do the same. Wow, really lucky the, the injuries weren't more serious today with so many people there. Lindsay Davis joined us live tonight near the site of that explosion. We know authorities are on the scene there behind you investigating, cleaning up. But, Lindsay, we just saw those decontamination centers. What are the health concerns for people who live near the blast, who work near the blast, and when will they be allowed to get back in to offices and, for many of them, their own apartments? We have some breaking news for you. You're looking at a live picture of a major building collapse in the East Village. Uh, Scarlett Food, our breaking news desk, has more. Scarlett, what can you tell us? Yeah, this is a building collapse on 2nd Avenue. The address is 125 2nd Avenue, uh, 7th Street and St. Mark's Place. It's in downtown Manhattan, and we have a 30 people injured, according to the New York Post. So this is a building collapse. Uh, I'm, I'm still looking through and seeing that there, on Twitter, there are multiple EMF, EMS buses are rushing over as well. You can see the smoke billowing into the air. We'll continue to keep you posted. We don't know the cause of this just yet. The latest count is 30 people injured in this building collapse. No word on fatalities. Once again, in downtown Manhattan on 2nd Avenue, uh, near 7th Street and St. Mark's. I've had a distinct blue hue. It was reflected across the cloudy sky, so it was seen for many miles around. Many people on social media wondering if an invasion, possibly an alien invasion, was underway. Tonight, we know what caused it. A bright blue light suddenly illuminates the skies over New York City. The blue light was enhanced by low cloud cover, making it visible for miles. ESPN anchorman Keith Olbermann watched in awe from his balcony. Unless those are the northern lights, I don't think those are the Many people posting videos to social media trying to figure out what caused the light. What is that? Turns out there was a massive explosion at a Con Edison power station in Astoria, Queens. In this video, you can hear a loud humming of the electricity arcing. The sudden electrical surge tipped the circuit breakers at nearby LaGuardia Airport, leaving passengers in the dark despite officials saying both arrivals and departures have resumed at the airport. Come on, come on, come on. Chopper video of that power station shows black scorch marks on the top of a substation building. Con Ed says there was no major damage, no one was injured, and most customers have power again. Oh, 911. <laughs>
looks like a pipe bomb sent to the CNN mailroom. Sounds, I mean, that's a, excuse me, that sounds like a fire alarm here. We'll keep you posted on that. But the network surprised on the air, learning along with the rest of the world. Explosive devices and other suspicious packages have sparked police investigations across the country, down the East Coast, from New York to Washington, D.C. to Florida, and a new discovery on the West Coast in Los Angeles. Also tonight, sources tell ABC News investigators are looking into a possible aid package, which may have been addressed to former Vice President Joe Biden, and no one seems to know when or where the next one might pop up. We will not let terrorism win. Not today, not ever. It all started two days ago at the home of billionaire liberal philanthropist George Soros, just north of New York City. George Soros is a well-known liberal financier, a very wealthy man and one of the top funders of democratic causes over the last couple of decades. A security guard found a live bomb described as similar to a pipe bomb in Soros's mailbox. Then late Tuesday night, another explosive device sent to Hillary Clinton, intercepted by the Secret Service before it reached her home in Westchester County, New York. A source familiar with the situation tells ABC News that former President Bill Clinton was at home at the time. Hillary Rodham Clinton. The former Secretary of State, hundreds of miles away on the campaign trail in Florida. Intense security surrounding her every move. We are fine, thanks to the men and women of the Secret Service, but it is a troubling time, isn't it? And it's a time of deep divisions, and we have to do everything we can to bring our country together. Just hours later, a suspicious device intercepted in Washington, D.C. on its way to former President Obama. The package was found at a screening facility located in Washington, D.C., uh, the package was immediately identified during the screening procedure, uh, and it never made it to its intended location. The area around the former commander-in-chief's home blocked off, the police chief delivering a stern message to whoever was behind the bomb. Sooner or later, uh, we are going to come and get you and hold you accountable for what you did. Back in New York this morning, just after 10.30, CNN was reporting on the spate of suspicious devices when their own alarms began to go off. Projectiles. I mean, that's a, excuse me, that sounds like a fire alarm here. We'll keep you posted on that. But to Employees caught evacuating live on television before the anchors go off air themselves, cutting to commercial. And CNN's employees weren't the only ones who had to evacuate. Their headquarters located in the Time Warner Center, a sprawling complex of apartments, shops, theaters, even a luxury hotel. Lights started going off. Event staff came in calmly said that the, to follow the orders of evacuation, but we realized it was serious and the, uh, the, the tone quickly changed to quiet and quick. We were just thinking or hoping that those bombs weren't going to go off. It's pretty scary. We're from all over the country. We're not used to this. Heavily armed police quickly converging on the scene. Responding officers identified a device that appeared to be a live explosive device. NYPD bomb squad responded secured the device and removed it for investigation. Additionally, there was an envelope containing white powder that was discovered as part of that original packaging. Here's a photo of that bomb and the package it came in. It was addressed to former CIA director John Brennan, but it misspelled his last name. Brennan addressed the situation during an interview tonight. I have full confidence in my former law enforcement and intelligence colleagues to get to the bottom of this. It was meant to kill or maim the individual who opened it, and anyone in close proximity when they opened it. It all started around 7 o'clock this morning. Two rice cookers were found at the Fulton Street subway station. A third rice cooker was later found at the 7th Avenue and 16th Street area in Chelsea. Police determined there was no danger, but the scare did cause extensive subway delays, and some streets were closed down. Everything, though, back up and running now. And police have released this photo of a man that they want to talk to in connection with all three of these incidents. Iowa News reporter Stacey Saker is live in Lower Manhattan. More, Stacey. Yeah, well, Diana, as you said, police are now linking all three of these devices, but the good news, the good news is the eight different subway lines down here at Fulton Street that were dramatically affected by this this morning, they are all back to normal. The other good news, police do know who they're looking for.
we thought ourselves better than this. Our streets, full of life and commerce, gripped by a riotous mob. Our promises, our treasured freedoms, these stand corrupted. There are better places and better times than New York City in July 1863. America is a country at war. For two years, this civil conflict has torn apart our nation. To tip the scales of victory in the North's favor, President Lincoln introduces the first draft in American history. A man's fate relies upon the selection of a name, and the turn of a wheel may mean his death sentence. The draft began on Saturday. The city's Irishmen were raising hell by Sunday. Men fumed over the realities of conscription. There was the prospect of death on the battlefield, the specter of freed slaves coming to steal jobs, the richer classes buying their way out of combat for $300. Pint by pint, their anger brings Manhattan to its boiling point. And so these men took to the streets, wielding clubs and stirring fear. Mobs of up to 500 stormed the draft office. From there, they turned against black men, women, and children. The police, many of them Irish themselves, fought against their brothers in a failed attempt to quell the violence. For three days and three nights, the destruction endured. A new day dawns in Manhattan. 120 civilians killed. 11 black men lynched, 50 buildings burned to the ground. Most ghastly lies the shell of the colored orphanage on 43rd Street. Fifth Avenue is forever changed. And what is left of our once proud city? Can we pull our society back together? Shame and shock settle upon us like ash. The city's heart broken. Whether brotherhood may be restored depends on wresting the streets back from the rogues. New York is a city severed. Anxious from behind closed curtains, we watch and wait. ...stormed into lower Manhattan last night. They destroyed store windows in Soho and lit fires during another night of violent protests. Eyewitness News reporter Candace McCowan spoke to business owners cleaning up the mess. What started as mostly peaceful protests, NYPD saying when night fell, the destruction began. Cameras capturing looters inside this Urban Outfitters at 14th and 6th, moments after the windows were shattered. This our right to protest. It don't go right. This is what you got to do. We got to stand united. Yeah, I'm disturbed by both sides of it. Honestly, I think the looting is completely justified. These people have been looted from by this country their entire lives. The damage was widespread throughout multiple neighborhoods. Apple stores, this Verizon store, and clothing stores. Not with just their windows shattered, but the contents inside taken. In the daylight, the graffiti could be seen up and down the street. In some cases, the name George Floyd. In other cases, angry messages directed at police. A night of unrest, leaving those tasked with cleaning up to tackle the mess. A showdown between protesters and police in the village overnight after what began as a peaceful demonstration to count every vote. Every vote counts! Turned into mass arrests downtown. Dozens of people locked up, some taken down with force, after the NYPD says a group of agitators tried to hijack a peaceful protest by lighting fires, throwing objects, and even a Pennsylvania woman spitting in the face of an officer. Don't let them steal your message. Separate from those agitators, and we will deal with them. The NYPD releasing photos of several weapons confiscated from the crowd of 500, including a stun gun, two knives, and M80 fireworks.
1977. The race for mayor between Koch and Cuomo was getting nasty, and everyone in the city was looking over their shoulder, fearful one of the country's most notorious serial killers had them in his sights. Just when it couldn't get any worse, came the blackout. For two days, more than seven million people were left in the dark. During that time, 1,600 stores were looted and almost 4,000 people were arrested. Now, I'll never forget seeing people breaking down stores and breaking windows and the cops being outnumbered and couldn't do much. After the blackout, it took days for the city to get on its feet again. But while the looting and rioting stopped, other crime didn't. During this time period, you throw in the arsonists and buildings being burned, the killings, homicide of, and people trying to survive. Crazy time. In the Bronx, the lion's share of chaos was being perpetrated by a whole new breed of criminals, street gangs. In 1967, there were an estimated 30 to 40 street gangs active in the borough. A decade later, that number had tripled. Well, one corner, you had the bachelors, order the dirty dozens, the black spades, the nomads, and the ghetto brothers. They only existed to commit crime. They were committing robberies, shootings, assaults, stabbings. Many of the gang members wound up dead. Many of them were arrested and were sentenced away for a long time in prison. But with nearly 5,000 gang members now roaming the streets, for everyone that got killed or locked up, there were five more ready to take their place. Good evening, I'm Peter Mansbridge from downtown Toronto. For the most part, an eerily dark Toronto. Well, if you had power 10 years ago today, you would have seen that rarity, a bearded Peter Mansbridge. The staff here at the National were among 50 million on the eastern seaboard plunged into darkness at 4.11 p.m. Eastern Time on August 14, 2003. The hours that followed were both confusing and chaotic as commuters tried to get out of downtown course without traffic lights or subways. But when the sun set, there was an eerie calm. I want to give you another look now at an unforgettable day. The Premier has declared a, an energy emergency across the province. In the downtown core, there is no power. September 11th, that's what's going through my mind right now. Maybe this is uh, Al-Qaeda's latest attack. The officials aren't even sure at this point how extensive this power outage is. What I can tell you is we have reports of blackouts covering basically all of Ontario. All of Ontario's blackout. We had no emergency backup systems go on. Employees used their cell phones to guide people down the stairs. There is no subway, there are no buses, there are no streetcars, nothing over now. We're all stuck together. I'm not able to contact my husband on the cell phone. I don't know about my kids. You know, it's all I'm not sure about it. Toronto flights to New York are suspended at this moment. Pearson Airport is on backup power. and we just found out the out-of-control driver who slammed right into that Brooklyn building faces charges, including driving while intoxicated. They say it was a huge boom, then the roof caved in, the walls crashed down. I'm going to take a look here at where it happened. News Force Wale LEU, live in the Midwood section of Brooklyn, Wale. We understand the car is actually still in that collapsed building there. It is, and I'm hearing it will be here for a while. Traffic around East Fifth Street and Avenue P here will be tight for the next couple weeks today. You can hear them around me. They're putting the fences up, and then tomorrow they're going to start securing the buildings nearby. And then Thursday, you can see that car right there. That's when they will start removing the car and cleaning up all of the debris. And I hear that. <laughs> Caught on camera, a driver goes full speed into a building. It's not clear how fast he was going but surveillance video shows him driving much faster than the rest of traffic. Horrific explosion. So I jump out of bed and I look. A deli and an apartment that used to look like this, now left in pieces. Oh my God. 
I don't know. It's crazy. <laughs> Police say after the crash, the driver got out and ran. He took off on foot and they caught him on King's Irish, the police. Department of Buildings getting an aerial view of the damage. It evacuated three nearby addresses after they say this car dislodged several of the vertical supports in the building. However, the car's impact stopped short of Michael Deere's business. Thank God nothing happened here, but it's so bad for the other businesses that are, are affected that can't get into their uh, stores. The owner of the building didn't want to talk on camera, but tells us he has insurance and is just thankful no one was killed. You can call that part of the story a miracle. Because at 11.30 last night, there would have normally been people inside the deli. But the store was just put up for rent. And the person who lived upstairs was still at work. He just lived the business one week before. No. Two weeks before. So the store was here? Yeah, yeah. Oh Thank God it's empty. And the guy over there at the top, the Spanish guy, and he walked in a restaurant. And he's walking at the same time. City. The image of the deadly crane collapse not far from the World Trade Center. One person was killed, several injured, people trapped in their cars. You're looking at live pictures from our station, WABC in New York, of the scene. The cab of that crane flipped over. First responders on the scene within seconds. Buildings evacuated. ABC's Jill Benitez leads us off from the scene tonight. Oh my God. Tonight, a crawler crane upside down, the monster of a machine capable of lifting 330 tons, crashing down in 30 seconds of terror. That moment caught on tape. There he goes, he's moving fast now, he's dropping it really quick now. Whoa. Pure steel, more than 50 stories tall, falling, falling, suddenly collapsing right onto cars on the road. Oh, it broke! Oh, it oh. TMZ video showing people nearby rushing to help that man inside. Keep going, keep going. I saw the crane coming down. And when it came down, it made a loud noise and it hit. Then we all ran to see if we could help out. At least three injured, but on the street, a 38-year-old Wall Street worker, David Wicks, killed. Officials say crane operators were trying to secure the crane because of wind and snow. And this incident occurred literally as they were lowering the crane to secure it. From this fifth story window, you can see that crane right there. It was being used to replace generators and air conditioners right on the roof of this building behind me. The crane sending debris everywhere, bricks scattered, and in this roof, a hole from a piece of equipment crashing through, ending up here on a desk. For much of the day, a threat of gas leaks. The deadly crash follows one in 2008, killing seven people, sparking safety measures that will no doubt be looked at again. And, David, the weather has since calmed down, but still, officials have ordered that all cranes in New York City be secured just in case. By the way, this crane was just inspected yesterday and checked out just fine.
as of right now, uh, like, I, like I confirmed earlier, we do have one person in custody. I can confirm that it is a white male in his 20s. Uh, I don't have any other information on that uh, uh, that will be released um, at a later time, but that's the information we have right now. The estimates of the shoppers at Walmart were between one and 3,000 with 100 employees present. I'm, I'm just following the lead that I've, that I've heard from the El Paso Police Department where they say there are strong indications that um, this shooter uh, wrote that manifesto and that this was inspired by his hatred of people here in this community. Here, ...revealing the worsening toll, at least 59 now dead, more than 500 injured. What they've now discovered in the suspect's Nevada home, his family, you'll hear from them tonight, and the faces of the victims. But first, what began to play out shortly after 10 p.m. local time right here in Las Vegas last night. ABC senior national correspondent Matt Gutman leading us off. The chaos unfolding in the heart of the Las Vegas Strip. 10.08 p.m., 22,000 country music bands packed in, enjoying the Route 91 Harvest Festival. But high above them on the 32nd floor of the glittering Mandalay Bay Resort, police say 64-year-old Stephen Paddock was watching. They say he hammered through the hotel's thick windows and started firing on the crowd below. Country star Jason Aldean was on stage, with automatic gunfire quickly drowning out his voice. <laughs> the music stops, he runs off stage. The audience huddling on the ground. The Mandalay looming over them. For so many, confusion was this part of the show. Well, that's just a firefighter. Seconds later, the rapid fire shooting starts again. <laughs> Terrified people pile on top of each other, sheltering behind anything they could. But they were in an open field, easy targets for the gunmen in the tower. I don't know where to go. Oh my God! Thousands looking for safety anywhere, even a stranger's car. Relax, relax. It was early this morning we found Mike Cronk, head in hands, still stained with his friend's blood. I hit three times. Mike had used his shirt to keep his friend from bleeding out. You guys are trying to do triage while the shooting is still going on. Yeah, everybody was everybody was jumping over the fences and stuff, but I mean, there's no way I'm going to leave my buddy, you know. We had to keep compression on this thing. As an army of police descended, high above the panicked crowds, SWAT teams are closing in on the shooter. They approach his hotel door, armed with an explosive. Breach, breach, breach. Police say they found panic dead inside. He had killed himself. Right now, we need your truck. We just need to get people over to the hospital, okay? Okay. Down on the ground, the sidewalk, now a triage center. We just saw a bunch of people that needed help, so we just started piling them in the truck. The entire Vegas Strip frozen, total lockdown. The American playground, now a killing field. These violent tragedies are a sobering reminder of how quickly life can change. Welcome to WatchMojo.com, and today we'll be counting down 10 of the most infamous mass shootings in United States history. Number 10, the Geneva County Massacre. Michael Kenneth McClendon began his rampage by killing his mother and burning her home. He then murdered more family members and took off in his car, killing indiscriminately as he went. Following a police chase and shootout, he committed suicide, and while he left behind a list of people who had done him wrong, his reason for killing was never established. Number 9. The 2011 Tucson Shooting U.S. Representative Gabrielle Giffords and some constituents were gathered in a grocery store parking lot when Jared Lee Lochner pulled out his gun. Among those killed were a federal judge, one of Giffords employees, and a nine-year-old girl. Giffords herself was also shot at point-blank range, and while she was initially listed as critical, she pulled through and made a truly inspiring recovery. Number 8. The Beltway Sniper Attacks 
John Allen Muhammad and Lee Boyd Malvo taunted police and held Washington, D.C., Maryland, and Virginia hostage by randomly shooting unsuspecting citizens from long distances. Nothing like this has ever happened in Montgomery County. Uh, this is a very safe community. Uh, our homicide rates just increased by 25% in one day. The pair was finally caught after intense news coverage three weeks later, and the rumored motive was Muhammad's anger at his ex-wife. While that was not proven, Muhammad was executed in 2009, and Malvo is serving six life sentences without the possibility of parole. Number 7. The Fort Hood Shooting This Texas spree was the worst shooting ever on an American military base. The accused was Army psychiatrist Major Nadal Malik Hassan, whose apparent belief in radical Islam, suspected Al-Qaeda ties, and alleged anger at the supposed war crimes of recently deployed soldiers he treated were tapped as possible motives. While he was paralyzed in the event, his trial was repeatedly delayed by his refusal to shave his beard based on religious beliefs. Number 6. Tower Shooting at the University of Texas at Austin after killing his wife and mother, former Marine Charles Whitman climbed the university's clock tower and inflicted almost two hours of panic upon the area by randomly shooting passers-by. This is a KLRN News bulletin. A sniper with a high-powered rifle has taken up a position on the observation deck of the tower on the campus of the University of Texas. His reign of terror ended when he was shot by a cop, and during his autopsy, he was found to have a fatal brain tumor that might have been the cause of his rage. Number 5. San Isidro McDonald's Massacre Police procedure was never the same once this Mexico border town was hit by the bloody rampage of a man who said he was hunting humans. James Oliver Huberty killed 22 people, ranging from 8 months to 74 years old, before he was downed by a sniper's bullet inside a McDonald's. Huberty's wife later unsuccessfully attempted to sue the restaurant chain by claiming their chicken McNuggets led to her husband's psychosis. Number 4. 2012 Aurora Shooting during a midnight premiere of The Dark Knight Rises, James Egan Holmes caused panic with tear gas and gun, killing 12 and injuring 58. Cops were on site within a minute and a half, and Holmes was apprehended soon after, but the damage was done. A gag order prevented his motive from being immediately made public, but rumors swirled that he referred to himself as the Joker. Number 3. Luby's Massacre in the deadliest U.S. shooting before 2007, George Hennard drove through the window of a Colleen, Texas diner and opened fire. Anger towards women and frustration over losing his job might have been contributing factors, though his motive was never established. Survivor Susanna Huff later lobbied heavily for concealed weapons laws as a member of the Texas House of Representatives based on her experience that day. Um, I've been sitting here getting more and more fed up with all of this talk about these pieces of machinery having no legitimate sporting purpose, no legitimate hunting purpose. People, that is not the point of the Second Amendment. Number two, the Virginia Tech Massacre. Virginia Tech was a gun-free zone when South Korean national Sung Hee Cho began targeting what he called rich kids, debauchery, and deceitful charlatans with gunfire. Despite tales of teachers and students sacrificing themselves for others, this was still the deadliest shooting by a lone gunman in U.S. history, and it ended when the shooter took his own life. In the wake of this tragedy, school security countrywide increased. Number 1. The Columbine High School Massacre Dylan Klebold and Eric Harris planned to use guns and homemade bombs to cause anarchy at their Littleton, Colorado school. The bombing failed, but Columbine was still one of the deadliest ever American school shootings. Images from that day continue to haunt us, and the massacre was blamed on bullying, violent movies and video games, goth culture, and even Marilyn Manson. But the shooter's suicides make the motive even tougher to decipher. These tragic massacres improved law enforcement's responses to similar circumstances, and reminded us that, without acknowledging our past, we are destined to repeat it. Check out more historical top 10s by subscribing to watchmojo.com.